The subject of my talk is uh, economic growth, our modern day religion, question mark. And to begin, um, economic growth is the religion of the modern world. The elixir that eases the pain of social conflicts, the promise of indefinite progress. It offers a solution to the everyday drama of human life, to wanting what we don't have. Sadly, at least in the West, growth is now fleeting, intermittent. These are the words that open The Infinite Desire for Growth, a book published this year by Daniel Cohen, professor of economics at the École Normale Supérieure in Paris and a founding member of the Paris School of Economics. I'll come back to Cohen's arguments in more detail shortly, but I begin with them because they take us to the heart of my subject matter this evening. Is economic growth our modern day religion? What would this mean? What do we mean by religion in this context? Is faith in this religion, if it is one, fading, at least in the West? And is this a good thing or a bad thing? These are some of the big questions I'll be engaging with. And to provide a sneak preview, my argument is going to be that the idea of indefinite ongoing growth does function religiously. It takes the form of a faith, it provides a sense of meaning and consolation for the evils and misfortunes of life, most centrally our mortal condition, and it is based on a metaphysical vision of reality. It is with respect to this last point, I should add, on the metaphysical vision underpinning the idea of economic growth, that my topic fits most squarely into this series of talks organized by promoting economic pluralism. Because this metaphysical vision is also what underpins economics more generally. Economics, that is, at least in the sense in which Steve Keen uses it in his debunking economics, orthodox economics, neoclassical economics for the most part, as well as the neoliberal political economy, which is sought to extend this vision of reality to more and more aspects of social life. So to outline the structure of this talk. Um, first, I'm going to introduce myself and the academic research I'm carrying out um, this talk comes out of. Next, I'm going to say a few words about why this topic matters, and not just in terms of this being a live debate intellectually, but in terms of the economic situation it connects to, and thus its overriding political urgency. And then I'm going to go through my actual argument. And in terms of that argument, I'm going to begin by discussing a story as it is set out by some more heterodox economists, one in which growth does function as a kind of religion, and in which this is a faith we need to break with, not least on environmental grounds. And then I'm going to discuss an alternative story, one set out by more mainstream economists, in which ongoing growth is to be pursued on rational grounds, and in which it is sound economics to believe that it can continue indefinitely, even for another six or seven billion years. <laughs> and then I'm going to inquire into the second story, the mainstream one, and I'm going to rummage around and pull out its theoretical guts, as it were. And I'm going to seek to show that one of the concepts at its heart is something called economic reality, and how this is a deeply metaphysical form of thinking. But first, um, as I said, let me briefly introduce myself and my research. Um, I'm a PhD candidate in the Political Economy Research Centre at Goldsmiths, University of London. Um, next slide, please. Where I'm being supervised by Will Davis, um, who you might know from his writings in The Guardian and his new books, Nervous States and Economic Science Fictions, which I highly recommend. Um, and next slide, please. Uh, previously, um, as Henry mentioned, I was a committee specialist at the House of Commons Environmental Audit Committee, where I drafted reports on the economics of climate change, emissions trading schemes, and green taxation. Um, I've also worked on reports on the value for money of a range of government policies from the National Audit Office, and I've written a variety of articles on political economy, especially regarding the environment for publications such as the International Journal of Green Economics. Um, next slide, please. Um, the latest thing I've written, incidentally, is a working paper for CUSP, um, the UK Centre for the Understanding of Sustainable Prosperity 
on the rhetoric of environmental scepticism. And on this subject, it's Cusp, uh, whose director, as Henry mentioned, is Tim Jackson, who's best known for his book, Prosperity Without Growth, um, who are funding my PhD. My research comes under Cusp's strand of work on the meanings and moral framings of prosperity. My PhD asks the question why it is that in the nearly five decades since publication of the Club of Rome's Limits to Growth report, the message at its core, that you can't have infinite growth on a finite planet, has not exerted a greater influence in international politics. In investigating this question, I am performing a reading of the Limits to Growth debate through another debate, the Secularization Thesis debate. Next slide. Um, and uh, we have here a couple of pictures of um, a couple of main protagonists in this debate. So there's the, on, on the left there, there's the German philosopher Karl Lurvitt, and on the right, um, uh, not a picture of, uh, is a, uh, an opponent of his in the debate, but of a uh, central book, um, that's Hans Blumenberg, <coughs> The Legitimacy of the Modern Age. In my treatment, um, particularly the exchange between these two, uh, this concerns a debate on the extent to which the worldview of secular progressive modernity can be understood as having been shaped by mainly Christian theological concepts and thereby still being shot through with theology. In particular, I am working with the argument emerging from this debate that a foundational concept for the worldview of secular modernity was the emergence in the early modern period of a new concept material or physical infinity. That's to say the transference of a concept formerly reserved to describe the absolute God, becoming transmuted into a new scientific view of nature, of the universe in which imminent reality extends into infinite space. A further theory emerging from this debate is that Alongside this idea of physical infinity, there developed an idea of human progress in which, through an infinitely cumulative process of scientific observation and experiment, humanity would, over an expanse of future time, become the masters and possessors of nature, in the words of Descartes, and find ourselves enlarging the bounds of human empire to the affecting of all things possible, as Bacon. So to be brief then, what I'm doing in this research is exploring a reading in which the contemporary defences of the idea of indefinite growth can be understood as defending some of these central philosophical foundations of progressive modernity. That this is the clue, in other words, to understanding what is going on in the limits to growth debate at its most fundamental level. Um, next slide. Um, at this point, let me briefly emphasize why I think this topic matters. Because if we can improve our understanding, improve our understanding of our contemporary political attachments to an idea of unending economic growth, then I believe we'd have a greater chance of being able to switch these attachments to another system. And this in turn matters because of the state of the planet. <coughs> to take climate change alone, recent reports by the United Nations the World Meteorological Society and the US National Climate Assessment make for distressing reading. The outlook is not good. As the UN highlights, there is an enormous gap between what we need to do and what we're actually doing to prevent dangerous levels of climate change. So, to turn now to the argument that I want to sketch out. Um, can you, next slide, please. And to go back now to Daniel Cohen's infinite desire for growth. As Cohen presents it, growth is a good thing. Not just for its material benefits taken on their own, although these benefits should not be downplayed, and nor should the hopes and demands of billions of people around the globe for a more equitable dis distribution of some of them. But as I say, for Cohen, growth is good not so much for its material benefits as for its social and psychological benefits. It gives us something to focus on and to strive for. And it needs to do this 
Cohen says, keying into a mainstream current of economic thought, going back at least as far as the marginal revolution, because no matter what level of material wealth we enjoy, it will never be enough to truly fulfill us. Okay, next slide, please. Cohen writes, like a walker who never reaches the horizon, the modern individual wants to grow ever richer, and not understanding that such wealth, once it has been achieved, will become the normal state of affairs, from which she will again want to distance herself. Human desire is profoundly malleable, influenced by the social circumstances in which it finds expression. That makes it insatiable, infinite. Economic growth, then, or rather the civilization which makes a religion of it, is presented here in a quite tragic form. Albeit, while growth holds good, this is a kind of suspended tragedy. What brings this tragic quality home to us is when growth starts to give out. For if growth is a religion, as Cohen suggests, then within this story, it is one whose God has become remote, unreliable, and perhaps soon to be declared dead. Cohen discusses a range of reasons as to why this modern faith is becoming harder to maintain. The two main ones he offers are that growth has been declining in developed economies and for the majority of Western workers since the 1970s, and that even more importantly, the impossibility of radically decoupling economic activity from environmental impacts places absolute constraints on future growth. Cohen likens the resulting mood we are experiencing today <laughs> to the spiritual angst of the European mind in the 17th century, as it struggled to adjust to the waning of belief in the presence of God in a scientific universe. Today's politics of xenophobic scapegoating <laughs> comes as no surprise to him in such bewildering times. In addition to this discussion of Cohen's book, I'd like to make a mention of the work of Tim Jackson. In another text, which was first published as a cusp working paper this year, The Post-Growth Challenge, Secular Stagnation, Inequality, and the Limits to Growth, Jackson also writes on the theme of secular stagnation, slowing down growth. And like Cohen, but much more emphatically, he argues that not only is growth slowing down, with deleterious social impacts in a system still geared for continuous growth, but that it is environmentally unsupportable, and that the physical throughput of resources must be curtailed if we are to have a chance of staying within vital planetary boundaries. In this, he is working in a tradition of ecological economics, founded half a century ago by the likes of Nicholas Georgescu Rogan and Herman Daly, who stressed that the economy should be understood as a subset of nature, and that ultimate limits are placed on our use of natural resources by the physics of entropy. And one final word on Jackson here, he is also like in our pursuit of economic growth to a religion, or to be more precise, he has analyzed consumerism as a form of theodicy, and in this inspires some of the orientation of my research. <laughs> theodicy, just to be clear, is, as Jackson reminds us, the attempt to reconcile the concept of a benevolent and omnipotent God with the existence of evil and suffering in the world. From a secular psychological perspective, the Odyssey can also be construed in terms of a search for meaning. Faced with persistent injustice, the prosperity of ill-doers, the persecution of the righteous, how should we seek to live? What kind of morality are we to live by? Confronted with our own mortality, the persistence of suffering, the sorrow of bereavement, where should we turn for solace? How are we to protect the authority of compassion and the promise of love? Where, in short, are we to find meaning in our lives? As regards interpreting consumerism as a failed form of the Odyssey, Jackson view this, views this in a number of ways, but one of them is to stress the power of the idea abundance and growth. The seemingly endless availability consoles us for the temporary nature of our lives, for our disappointments and failures. It assures us that society holds out the promise of better lives for us 
and for our descendants in the future. So, looking at these two economic thinkers together, here we have a story. It's a story in which the pursuit of ongoing economic growth and the promises of ongoing consumer purchases this translates into provides whole societies with something akin to religious meaning. But as with any story, it's one with a beginning, a middle, and an end. And we are now perhaps at the beginning of the end. Trying to wring more growth out of the system is increasingly making the majority of us unhappy and destroying the environment at the same time. We're beginning to perceive that it can't go on forever, and that's reducing the faith we have in it, the religious meaning we can draw from it. We are increasingly falling prey to, as Cohen put it, a spiritual angst. So that's one story we have there. But it's not the only one. There's another story. One which takes much of the same material and accepts many of the same challenges, but turns it into something else providing us with a happy ending. Or rather, and this is a crucial bit, no ending at all. We can equally begin this story with some recent contributions. Next slide. Let us start, in fact, in October this year, when the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences awarded the Sveriges Reichsbank Prize in Economic Sciences in memory of Alfred Nobel, commonly known as the Nobel Prize for Economics, to Paul Romer and William Nordhaus. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Romer, celebrated as a pioneer of endogenous growth theory, was awarded his prize for integrating technological innovations into long-run macroeconomic analysis. Nordhaus, his for integrating climate change into long-run macroeconomic analysis. The Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences summarized how they were intersected as follows. Nature dictates the main constraints on economic growth, and our knowledge determines how well we, we deal with these constraints. Roma's work was thus presented as concerning the economics of reconciling growth with environmental limits. And it was in this capacity that Roma's award was celebrated by those most vociferously opposed to environmentalist arguments, such as Tim Jackson's, on the need to constrain economic growth. Next slide, please. Uh, one such critic, Ronald Bailey, science correspondent for Reason, <coughs> um, a neoliberal magazine website in the US, trumpeted Roma's win as having been based on his conceptual overthrow of old-fashioned limits to growth economics. Economic growth and wealth creation is limited only if one believes that human ingenuity is limited. Roma's new growth theory transforms economics from a dismal science that describes a world of scarcity and diminishing returns into a discipline that reveals a path toward constant improvement and unlimited potential. Next slide. Closer to home, the sustainable investment expert Michael Libra authored a blog entitled The Secret of Eternal Growth, which received considerable attention recently, and which described the awarding of Nobel Prizes to Roma and Nordhaus as a huge slap in the face for the champions of degrowth. Liebreich, it should be pointed out, is by no means <coughs> an anti-environmentalist. He accepts the need for urgent action on climate change, for example. His main point is that the number one thing this requires right now is massively accelerated investment in low carbon energy, and that this is less likely to be forthcoming if the mood music coming from environmentalism is anti capitalist. In this sense, he describes himself as an eco pragmatist. So, Liebreich describes himself as a pragmatist. But let's take a look at some of the language he uses. Next slide, please. In using Roma's work to suggest that ongoing economic growth is compatible with mitigating climate change, Liebreich makes the far reaching claim that there is nothing in physics to stop the economy from growing forever. How does he support this? Thing? He begins by criticizing the way in which ecological economists, 
going back all the way to George S. Rogan and Herman Daly, have grounded their economics in the physics of entropy. He describes this, provocatively, as an example of faith in science. This is because the Earth receives a huge daily flux of energy from the Sun, and thus solar power could well be the key to endless growth, proving that the economy can grow for as long as there is still a Sun in the sky, which would give us about another 5 billion years. But it is not only energy from the Sun that will allow for such seemingly endless growth. Lee Bright prefers us also to human ingenuity. It is this. The creative power of our minds, which will enable us progressively to dematerialize the entire economy. As he tells us, material efficiency and recycling will improve indefinitely. The extraction of materials and production of pollution will first peak and then asymptote to zero. And this combination of unlimited knowledge and clean energy will thus drive endless improvements in human well-being and flourishing. Finally, he concludes, we should approach the task with optimism because as Ronald Reagan, displaying a more thorough understanding of thermodynamics and economics than the entire degrowth crowd, once said, there are no such things as limits to growth because there are no limits on the human capacity for intelligence, imagination, and love. I just want to highlight something in these words. We have the next slide. What do we see here? Eternal growth, growing forever. Endless growth, billion years, improving definitely to zero. Unlimited knowledge, endless improvements, no limits. This is the language of the absolute. These are clues, I would suggest, that this type of thinking about economics is anchored in a profoundly metaphysical conception of reality. <coughs> Now, Michael Liebreich is in no way an outlier in this. This language and these arguments are in no way unique to him. Where did they come from? The reference to Reagan gives us some clues. Reagan himself was popularizing arguments which have been developed by a number of environmentally skeptic economists, not least Julian Simon. Simon, in turn, drew and exerted his own influence upon a range of economists whose primary focus lay outside the environment. This included Friedrich von Hayek, who wrote to Simon with excitement, I have never before written a fan letter to a professional colleague, but to discover that you have in your economics of population growth provided the empirical evidence for what with me is the result of a lifetime of theoretical speculation is too exciting an experience not to share it with you. It might indeed be possible to talk of a certain Hayek, Simon, Reagan axis of ideals, I providing the main framework of economic ideas, Simon developing these specially, specifically to counter the limits of growth thesis, and Reagan communicating the sentiments of their heart to a mass audience. What are these ideas in outcome? Go to the next slide, please. Simon countered the limits thesis with an argument that could be perhaps reduced to five main propositions. That human imagination and ingenuity, being not physical, are limitless. Thus, people are the ultimate resource. That it is by participating in the market and receiving price signals to indicate resource scarcity that ingenuity is incentivized and trained to solve the most economically important problems. With the market's collective wisdom ensuring that the best solutions are selected. Thus, government intervention will only impede the overcoming of environmental limits. That physical resources are in principle fully interchangeable, and that with enough energy it is possible to synthesize any particular resources we wish. Thus, energy is the master resource. That solar energy ensures the Earth is not a closed system, and thus not limited by the physics of entropy, providing us with effectively limitless supplies of the master resource, and enabling us over time to invent and accomplish anything we want. And that human wants are insatiable, and that it is precisely in continually seeking to realize our unlimited desires that we create progress. Thus, the limitlessness of human desires is intrinsically bound up with a process which leads to their continual realization, that is, growth. 
we might, with reference to Lee Bright's article, dealt the totality of these ideas, the story of eternal growth. Individual elements of the story, if not the whole ensemble, have become aspects of economic common sense in much subsequent debate on the environment. Taken together, these principles add up to a metaphysical construct I expect we might all here be familiar with under the name of economic reality. In what's left of my talk, I will attempt to briefly unpack what this means, highlighting the interplay of three ideas. The idea of the mind, the idea of technological progress, and the idea of the market. Regarding the market, what we find in this story is the idea of the mental as the essence of limitlessness. This is visible in the emphasis on fantasy as the characteristic mode of mental activity. Reagan's speeches, for example, being littered with references to dreams and imagination. It's visible in the assertion of the insatiability of human desires. Most of all, it's visible in the idealization of ingenuity, giving rise to widely cited arguments along the lines of stating, as one obituarist of Simons put it, supplies of natural resources are not finite in any serious way. They are created by the intellect of man and always renewable results. It is here we see not only a conception of the mental as limitless, here in the form of an endless fecundity of invention, but its projection onto physical reality, specifically the environment, conceived as the material basis for economic activity. In this fashion, for example, Simon writes about viewing the resource system as being as unlimited as the number of thoughts a person can have, simultaneously linking a concept of the infinite bounteousness of nature, both with the idea of the ingenuity which would unlock it, and with the weightless quality of that mental activity itself. Regarding the second idea to be highlighted here, that of technological progress, here we find another respect in which the limitlessness of the mental is projected onto the physical. What this means is that an observation of historical progress since the Industrial Revolution is first hypostasized into a law of history, and thereby assumed to hold for the foreseeable future. It is then projected <coughs> forwards into a speculative consideration of the far future, by which time, through a simple additive process, it is assumed our technological capacities will have grown to near infinite abilities to translate will into reality, before this impression of near infinite power is projected backwards again into the present, and on to the agency, human ingenuity held to be responsible for the historical progress witnessed to date. As a final move, the omnipotent powers of this agency are projected onto nature. Rather, nature is viewed as being incorporated by these powers, becoming our creation, to be manipulated, exploited, improved, fixed, as we see fit. And if we are not quite equipped to control nature as we would like right now, it is only a matter of time before we will, thanks to this cumulative law of progress. Finally, there is that third idea, the market. In the work of Simon and others, in turn drawing on that notably of higher, it is in the market that minds are put into contact with each other, generating a kind of collective intelligence, turning the human race into a collective problem-solving machine, as the environmental skeptic Matt Ridley puts it. What connects individual minds up together are the twin mechanisms of individual economic incentive and the price signal. For many environmental skeptics, such as the welfare economist Wilfred Beckerman, so long as markets are allowed to work freely, this means we will never run out of anything at all. Anything. Or as Milton Friedman put it, in a proper price system, the market can take, can take care of the problem. The problem being, of course, environmental limits. And it's with Milton Friedman that I'd like to end. There's a great exchange of in a wonderful book by Carla Rabbi <coughs> entitled Economists and the Environment, which nicely expresses what I'm talking about 
when I refer to something called economic reality, like that next slide. Friedman and Raphael, they are having an argument about whether natural resources are really limited or not. Friedman takes issue with her view of scientific reality, which says that of course physical resources are finite. Friedman tells her, take oil for example. Everyone says it's a limited resource, physically it may, but economically we don't know. Economically, there is more oil today than there was a hundred years ago. When it was still under the ground, no one knew it was there wasn't economically available. When resources are really limited, prices go up. <clears throat> the price of oil has gone down and down. Rabbi Oli responds. Of course, the discovery of new oil wells has given the illusion of unlimited oil. To which Friedman comes back, why an illusion? Because we know it's a limited resource, she says. Excuse me, Friedman replies, it's not limited from an economic point of view. The meaning of what Friedman is saying here is easily overlooked, normalised by treating it as a mere figure of speech. If you pay attention to what he's actually saying, you can see that he's literally saying that thanks to market-driven ingenuity, the natural resources that we depend on are unlimited. And he's not a one-off. This is a standard view. It's championed in an explicit sense by those who use economics to argue against the limits of growth thesis, such as a left-wing follower of Julian Simons, Julian Simons next slide, who argues counterintuitively that because you can imagine subdividing a finite object unto infinity, you can actually have infinite growth on a finite planet. But this is a highly prevalent feature of economic thinking in general. To conclude, what is economic reality then? but the product of a belief that the world is mind, or rather is progressively becoming so. This is to describe an intellectual process in which the mental is conceived of as being limitless, and through economic growth, understood as the market-driven application of innovation to overcome material limitations, the material world is increasingly made subject to, its resistance to our will dissolved by, the mental and so is infused with the mental's quality of limitlessness. If I haven't had the time or the capabilities tonight to substantiate my argument more fully, I would still like to offer it as a contribution to an overarching argument which sees in the defense of indefinite economic growth an intellectual project to infinitize the world. And that behind this lies a drive for theodicy, which within a secular understanding of reality, means the bolstering of faith in an eternal future for human progress. Thank you for listening. Thanks very much, Richard. I might just uh, uh, take uh, uh, the opportunity to ask you a couple of questions to start with. Um, as I say, you've, you've talked about maybe the theology or the theological dimension of religion um, in terms of you know, these, these great thinkers and so forth. And um, religions obviously have other aspects to it, like you know, worship, uh, catechism, uh, um, things like this. So do you, so in, in suggesting that economic growth is a religion, do you also, what do you see as the catechism, the, uh, um, the um, where do we worship? Is, is, can you also make the, 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 uh, the argument that the process of consumption or something like that is a sort of religious act as well? Or uh, are we going too far? Um, well, certainly I'm not alone in exploring this area um, and there's I think an increasing interest in the idea of economic theology um, which uh, is possibly developed from or alongside uh, an increasing interest in uh, political religion as well um, to be Honest, what I'm, what I'm concentrating on is 
I suppose it's not so much religion in the sense that you described it correctly, in terms of uh, looking at some of the, um, the, the disciplines and structures and rituals of uh, um, an organized religion, but more the um, theodicy, the theodosal elements and the search for a sense of meaning and grounding of one's mortal life in something uh, wider and longer lasting. So I, I possibly wouldn't go looking for you know, analogies um, you know, whereby you treat the supermarket as a form of church, things like that. I think possibly uh, push that a but, I mean, it is interesting that now you can go shopping on Sundays, and shopping <coughs> is now seen as a leisure activity, and not you don't go shopping to buy things. Um, you go shopping to be comforted in being a shopping environment. So I don't know if uh, uh, you might be able to push your argument. You, you might well, and uh, certainly Tim Jackson has explored um, the, the obviously of consumers. And the next thing I just want to, you made an interesting remark that uh, making a parallel between uh, where we are now and the 17th century um, in terms of experiencing the being in the in a time of a sort of failing religion though of course interestingly at the beginning of the 16th century it was a huge flowering of religions that uh, uh, of Protestant religions wasn't there but are there is there anything we can learn from the 17th century at that period which will help us uh, understand more about what might happen now, uh, apart from obviously the, um, the, the, the identity politics, I suppose, that everyone's got to be like everyone else, that sort of thing. Was that, can you actually, can you track that? Can we see identity, more identity politics in the 17th century? What, what sort of... Um, um, on the identity politics angle, I would refer to the sociologist Sigmund Bauman's analysis of liquid modernity, which was his term for, instead of post-modernity, his term really for um, changes in people's mentalities post the 70s in a neoliberal age, um, whereby uh, we came to lose belief in the future, essentially, as being a, a, a losing really visions of science fiction and, and uh, visions of a utopian future towards which we were progressing. Um, and in place of that, or we, we talked about um, how that um, left people feeling um, much more isolated because that eroded secular immortality uh, belief systems whereby one could identify oneself with a human collective which was the progress through the expanse of future time such as one's class or one's nation or a progressive vision of humanity as a whole as those kinds of visions and, and class and national mentalities began to fade away he suggested that left people more isolated and as a result, people became more desperate to find temporal collectivities in which to take shelter. So I think that's a, that's, that's a good uh, analysis, um, sociological analysis of um, the right of identity politics, uh, one aspect of it. Anyway, um, what, I would, what I would, the overarching lesson I would take out of the secularization thesis debate which I mentioned before was that, um, uh, that Hans Blumenberg, one of the German philosophers I mentioned earlier, has a uh, basically it's a theory of historical development whereby um, the Odyssey is the, the overriding factor. And his explanation for the coming of the, the modern epoch was essentially that um, high middle age. Um, theology uh, was failing to provide people with a sense of certainty and a sense of a, a relationship with uh, God and that in a um, theodosal vacuum 
a kind of new modern field. Theodosal vacuum. Theodosal oh, vacuum. I'll, I'll, I'll be using that. that. Uh, the theodosal vacuum. Yes. Um, <laughs> that allowed a new kind of modern theodicy to emerge in which humanity mm. would take responsibility for ourselves. How did that? Religion didn't disappear, obviously. <laughs> Absolutely not in the 17th century. But, it, but in terms of an idea of what fundamental reality, objective reality was, and became, the divine became more excluded from it. And so we were much more left to our own devices. I mean, what I, to, to try to cut this short, the, the main lesson which emerges from it is that, and in this context, where I think environmentalism is failing, has failed, is in failing to offer a new theodicy to replace the modern theodicy, which ultimately the limits the growth thesis is antithetical to. That's essentially my reading of the limits the growth debate. And this is what I've found in environmental skeptics. What they're fundamentally doing, I think, is defending a vision of high modernity and progress. So we need a new religion. Kinda. Right, Adam, you just got your hand up first. Um, yes, thanks for the talk. It was fascinating, really interesting. Um, and I, I very much liked the, the questioning of the metaphysical assumptions behind the economics, which I think I agree with. This is a pretty important thing to study. The only thing I slightly take issue with, based on your response, is what, from a historical point of view, I understand it's worth talking about feel the sea, yeah. and I get where that comes from. The, the present argument, if you're arguing with another economist, with a mainstream economist, you may have to make these sort of metaphysical assumptions in order to argue with them. Would you want to accuse him of being a theodicist, or would you just say, here's your metaphysical assumptions, why are you making these assumptions? Well, here are the other, here is have to be more agnostic about your metaphysical assumptions. I mean, isn't that the best, it's, it's, it's a philosophy of science, question, because you have to make assumptions to do science. And in economics, there's metaphysical assumptions, just like in physics. Yeah. In physics, there's yeah. metaphysical assumptions. That's philosophy of science. You have to make some assumptions. Shouldn't we just be arguing about those assumptions and say, look, I'm a scientist, you're a scientist. I just disagree with your assumptions. Why, why are we accusing them of being <laughs> religious uh, wizards or something? Sure. <laughs> wizards? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, wizards are quite tiny. Yeah, yeah, they are, yeah, they're going for it. It's and a miracle. You can see the, the miracle is, is real. Yeah, you might say it's an illusion because it will fade away, but right now, there's a miracle. It's, it's, maybe it's a science, right? Yeah. You can see it. Sure. Yeah. yeah okay. So, what do you do with it? Yeah. Um, one thing I would say is that for the purposes of this talk, I have compressed bits of my um, thesis. And so, what I am trying to do is take it. Take things a chapter at a time, so that I'm not overloading bits of analysis with interpretation. Uh, so, um, in one chapter, I will be simply trying to look, expose some of these metaphysical assumptions without then trying to place them into an interpretation around the other series and like that. Although I'll then try and work with that in another chapter, essentially, so that. Um, I'm trying to build a case gradually and not overloading it and also <laughs> ultimately my defense of what I'm doing in my overarching method is taken from the philosopher Charles Taylor who's uh, talking about the hermeneutical approach is what I'm overall, overall taking which is ultimately you know it's down to the reader to, to, to judge how compelling it is how coherent and compelling it is um, ultimately you can hop off the train at a certain point, but um, that hopefully will not invalidate some of the more empirical research which is contained within the, the overall framework. Um, the other thing, though, I want to suggest, though, is that, that where the argument remains um, in economics, or at least it, it's from the side of the um, environmental skeptics and eco-modernists, Frequently, their attitude is that what they're talking about is very hard-headed, and that it's simply the environmentalist um, uh, assertion that um, physical things are limited is the crazy idea. 
um, and the religious wild idea. And so, just as an illustration of that, I mentioned the welfare economist Wilfred Beckham, no Beckham earlier, who was saying we will never run out of anything for anything. Um, and, uh, and he said, <coughs> the quote runs on that, um, or even if we do run short of something, that will probably be in a hundred million years, by which time, surely, would have worked out a way around it better. Um, and then he follows it up with saying, in his, in his responses to environmentalists, I am just against utopianism, which, <laughs> which I see as is in the, you know, indefensible I'm in for the hard of um, So I, I don't think it, 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 it hurts to, to probe some of these things. Well, I think just this is to some extent a question of tactics, isn't it? Because if you say you're you're a you, you're a religious xenoph, it's sort of seen as a an insult. So they won't listen to you. But I suppose wouldn't you also say that if they are a religious xenoph, they won't listen to you anyway? So oh, well, <laughs> you can't actually have a rational argument with anyway. So uh, it's better not to bother well, talking to them. Yeah, well, no. Well, I want to say two things on that. Two things. First of all, I am not using economic religion secular religion in a pejorative sense, in a, using religion in a pejorative sense like that, to mean, well, obviously fanatical and irrational, which is a way that um, it frequently is used and has been used from when it's kind of first developed as a concept in the 1930s, when the likes of Raymond Aron were talking about national socialism and Stalinist communism as political religions. Um, I am rather saying that um, it's an entirely rational um, aspect of human existence to try to understand our place in the cosmos. That's the thing I'm saying. So I'm not simply saying they're fanatical and crazy. The other thing I would say is, um, go back to the Michael Liebreich's um, piece on the secret of eternal growth, that did prompt a few, you know, responses, comebacks, including one from Tim Jackson, which went on uh, in quite a lot of detail about talking about the physics of entropy and why he was wrong on the physics and why he was wrong on the economics. And he just backed it away and said, no, you're wrong, you don't understand it. <laughs> and I think possibly in, in cases like that, it helps to just go underneath the surface of arguments a little bit. Um, I think that was fascinating because it introduces um, lots of problems um, and solutions. Now, you mentioned the, the ingenuity of man to solve problems. Um, for example, um, there's plenty of energy around. Um, if we harvest half the sun that's falling on Libya, we've got quite enough for the whole of the world. And there's lots of other places we could harvest it from. Um, there's... Um, and if you think back to a hundred years ago, I had some distant relative who went on a boat to Australia and never ever saw her parents again. Um, if you told them at the time, well, it's all right, you'll be able to watch them on Skype, people would have said, don't be ridiculous. Um, you know, they wouldn't have imagined that something like that was possible. Similarly, computing capacity. Um, if you talked about what we can do with a computer now, and you said that to somebody um, in 1940, this is definitely ridiculous. So our ingenuity has solved lots and lots of problems, but the suggestion that we've ever solved any problem, we'll never run out of anything, that's where I have difficulty. For example, um, if we go on with economic growth, assume, let's say, America goes on growing at um, 2% per annum for the next 100 years. And by that time, inequality, um, the rest of the world catches up with them. Um, we'll have um, a, a global economy which is about a hundred times what it is today. And it's quite difficult to imagine we've actually got enough resources to um, sustain that. So, you know, there are two sides to the argument. I don't know where, we, where I am on that. Um, I'll just say on that that I am in no way um, seeking to undermine, um, uh, you know, undervalue ingenuity, what we're capable of, or indeed the importance of markets. It's simply 
the extra magical thinking overlaid on them, which supposes that because we've done X, then we'll be able to do Y, Z, and uh, you know infinitely more. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, thanks. So that's fun to talk, and I think that there's a lot of um, truth in, in what you're talking about, the, the Odyssey argument, and um, so, and it's really difficult to to argue against growth because of all the great things it has given us up to now, and then also also because it is the um, like you were saying in the beginning of the talk, kind of the uh, um, principle of modernity, and so. But also, do you think that it's? I remember reading once. I can't remember who said it, but it's the idea that um, that um, it's actually the way human societies work is that it's uh, beneficial to believe in absurd beliefs because it binds society together. I mean, so, for example, the ancient Egyptians they believed that their parents would turn up sort of would live forever, so they built pyramids and they they, they had cohesive societies in some way. Sort of work mm -hmm. So this is growth, and growth obviously is very attractive because it does lots of good things up to now. Um, so that's one one question, and the other question is if you are, if you do want to question it and if you want to argue with it, and this is quite a hard question, but what what is the um, because I agree with you about the environmental movement that it's sort of failed to to uh, produce a, an attractive alternative, but what is the alternative that you can argue in favour of? Answers on postcard. <laughs> yes. Um, for me, going up, answering the second point first, I see a lot of value simply in trying to highlight what I think the fundamental problem is. And so, what I'm trying to argue is that environmentalism, um, you know, most essentially based around the Lynx Grove thesis, is posing not primarily a political crisis, framing things in terms of political crisis, but, but rather a philosophical crisis. Um, in terms of our self-identity, our consciousness of, of what humanity is, what we're for, and what our future is. Because fundamentally, I think it is at odds with, you know, very foundational currents of modernity, um, which you know, fundamentally the, um, the idea of human progress, material progress. Um, and I think generally environmentalists have, have not been good at recognizing that themselves. And it's for that reason that um, I think that they, they've struggled, I should say we as well as environmentalists. Um, and, but I think the, at least trying to um, raise people's focuses and make people aware that there's a, another theoretical dimension on which the answer might lie, might then at least encourage people to be thinking about it. And that in itself, speaking personally, that in itself has provided me with a certain amount of um, uh, confidence and kind of intellectual security about it. Reading um, Thomas Kuhn's Structure of Scientific Revolutions, he talks about paradigm shifts. And he says that um, generally, you know, theories, paradigms are not abandoned because people poke holes in them, because people know that there are problems with them. They can't, these theories are failing to describe fundamental aspects of reality. They are not abandoned because there are things wrong with them, because they, people need um, a purchase on reality. And a theory, if it's successful, will provide some of that. Um, and usually it takes people, uh, often young people, people new to a field, um, to have the confidence to you know, think from scratch and come up with a new theory. Um, but in doing that, I think what provides them with the confidence to, to just kind of 
let's take that leap into the unknown, is the faith that there must be an answer out there. That, that reality is fundamentally intelligible, um, and that kind of operates as a kind of, of clutch in terms of one's sort of philosophical beliefs, and they enable you to shift gears. You know, it gives you the confidence to know that I don't know the answer now, but I'm, I think there's one out there. I think fostering more of that sense will encourage people to, to think in that direction. I'm sorry, what's your first point again? <laughs> uh, is, is, is it a feature of human society generally that's oh. beneficial for you? So, yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, I suppose, uh, the, the, well, growth is, is as a, a lot, which isn't absurd, as in people, there's a historical experience people are aware of, I can point to. And, uh, and it's also rational to want to believe in it because then, as, as one of the Tim Jackson quotes said, you have a feeling that things are getting better and things will be better for my descendants, and that provides a sense of security. Um, I, but I suppose where it fits in with what you're saying is it's, it is intangible, and it, you have to take it on faith. And I think it's a requirement for faith probably does fulfill that role you were describing. Can I just give a, a, a defense of the environmental movement yeah. to see what you um, respond to that? Because um, I would say the environmental movement has tried to find alternatives. Haven't it? I mean, the, the move to try and create this idea of well being and, uh, you know, the, uh, and also there's the simplicity movement in, uh, in the US. And, and people trying to say, well, you have to get back to the fundamentals of what makes you feel good and relationships and spending time with your kids and going for nice walks, all these sorts of things. So there has been an attempt to do that, even if it hasn't really gained purchase, maybe. I mean, is that something, was that going in the right direction? Um, or is that not, if, or do you think that's not the right direction? We need a different direction? Or has it failed because it's sort of been overwhelmed by the wider system, which is still tenacious. Oh, I think environmentalism does wonderful things, marvellous things, it's got loads of great ideas. And um, as you were describing there, I think um, the, the work of CUSP, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, you know, I'm quite a, a proselytiser for what CUSP does, because I think it's, it's exciting because it's operating in different strands, um, very uh, theoretical in certain areas and very... And it's got an archbishop art working with it. Exactly. It's that absolutely. Must be. <laughs> um, but you it's, must know something. you know, deeply interested in well-being, what actually our experience of, of um, fulfilment and happiness, you know, what, what makes us feel like that, um, the, the, the types of experience. Loads of great stuff. Um, what I'm talking about, though, is, is something different, something on the plane of, of metaphysics of this search for a uh, purpose beyond, it's, you know, fundamentally there's lots of work on this, lots of research on this, looking at the psychology of um, terror management theory. Which? Man terror management. Terror management. Terror theory. management theory, which um, comes out of the uh, cultural anthropologist Ernest Becker's book Denial of Death, um, which is positing effectively, you know, various cultural our impulse to culture is, is driven by the need to feel connected with something which lasts beyond our mortal existence. And your kids aren't enough, if you have any. Well, what does environmentalism say? Environmentalism says that um, physical resources are limited. Um, you know, Herman Daly, what does he say? Um, he was. It was George S. Rogan was clear that physical entropy means that the human race as a whole is mortal because everything's mortal. The sun is mortal, the galaxy is mortal, the universe is mortal. We are certainly mortal collectively. Um, and Herman Daly was asked about this actually in that same book I mentioned, the Carla Ravioli book. And she said, Why don't you talk about this? He's, he's criticizing you for ducking it. How much time have we got? How sustainable is sustainable? And he said, well, you know, if we were to implement his ideas, ecological economics, steady state economics, 
um, it might have 500 degrees, human survival. Um, so, but if you think about that, then then the, the the former modern progressive promise of of a you know a future of an unend, unending quality of the future is cut away, is undermined. Um, and that, I think, it, you can really detect in the discourse of the Anthropocene, which is a highly depressing, <laughs> bleak um, literature, which um, I've read uh, more than I care to. <laughs> because while it's trying to look very squarely at our economic predicament and not to pussyfoot around with it, it's not offering anything else. It's offering no kind of sense of meaning for life. So fundamentally, I think it's still trapped inside a secular, progressive, modern worldview, but without uh, an overarching sense of hope or permanence about it. Yes, it's interesting. I know someone who's working in that space, and he's uh, examining how we managed to get through the Black Death as showing that humanity can cope with yeah. disaster. Could I ask you just to expand a bit on daily? One of the things I took from some of the stuff I read in Daly is his rejection of the individualized materialism model in favor of an organic cooperative model. And and what you were saying about human values and human mean, means and so on, the psychology of interpersonal relating and all that feeds into that debate. And, and with that in mind, I was puzzled that some of the people you're talking about start with physics and thermodynamics as, as the bottom line, whereas the, the daily sort of approach would start perhaps with photosynthesis and the, the biological organism as the bottom line, and that would give you a completely different model altogether. I'm, I'm, I'm just struggling with that in my head at the moment. There's, there's something about the individualized materialism mm -hmm. that underlies what you call material infinity or something, mm -hmm. which is so different from the organic cooperative relational model that Tim Jackson picks up on when he talks about flourishing and love and, and so on. Mm -hmm. So, well, have, have, am I getting away? Am I making any sense? Uh, yes. I'm, I'm, I think I'm trying to criticize those who say that physics is a lot of mind. Right. Um, well, I think George Esco Rogan does talk in those terms. Uh, fundamentally, that the, 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 the whole limits thesis is, you know, ultimately grounded in the physics of entropy because it's a more fundamental science level of, of reality. Um, so, I mean, ultimately, for example, that, that's discussing the um, energy received from the sun and the continuation uh, of, um, of energy, um, which is the, you know, the, the, the fundamental underpinnings of, of the idea of scarcity. I don't think it, it in any way disqualifies an, you know, an attention to biology, and certainly um, biology, uh, economics could do with much more uh, biological consciousness not least when we're talking about growth, because especially one of my bad bears is when people talk about not just green growth, but when they use verbs such as to grow something, um, because of course um, you know, the agency there is is within the organism itself, not the outside sponsor of it. You can produce produce the conditions for growth, but you know, I know uh, something grows, you don't grow it. Um, and, and clearly, 
in the biological world, nothing grows infinitely. Oh, we've got, uh, well, we've got many hands. Oh. Uh, uh, I saw it. Emily, we, we, we haven't had a, a woman. Thank you. Um, forgive me because I missed the majority of the talk. So if this is nonsensical, then just call me out. Um, it strikes me, a couple of ways, it strikes me that um, increasingly multiple perspectives, being able to hold multiple perspectives at a single time is so necessary in order to navigate the current position. And so um, you talk about how I was at a workshop a few weekends ago called Active Hope, using Joanna Macy's work, very much engaged in a sort of interpersonal process, and you feel into exactly what you're hopeful about and what you value. At the same time, looking at the state of the world and uh, from a very kind of uh, deep point of view. And I think uh, experiencing the hope and the grief are actually skills, quite hard skills, that probably are increasingly necessary in order for getting our heads out of the sand a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, it strikes me when you talk about progress, and I don't know whether you mentioned it in your talk, that we need a sort of new understanding of progress. Um, and when you talk about the language and growth, for example, you know, perhaps on terms of nurture, um, do you do you have a definition of progress that you think is uh, usable, worthwhile? Um, or is there a question that you find particularly useful in challenging uh, old assumptions of what progress might look like? Um, well, I suppose in in what I was talking about um, this evening, I was I was effectively I was commenting on another debate, the secularization thesis debate, which is uh, effectively. A dispute about the extent to which we can understand progress as a secularized form of, uh, of theology, of a you know eschatological um, concept. Um, and I would say that again, I I, I I see a lot of value in progress. I see, um, I, I value very much as well um, hope as a concept, and I'm with uh, the uh, historian Christopher Lash in preferring hope to optimism. Uh, he's, he links optimism to progress and, uh, and dislikes it because it's uh, an assumption, a kind of material assumption of things happening in a certain fashion and a certain linear uh, upwards fashion and, and in a very materialistic fashion, whereas hope is not um, uh, materialistic and is uh, it's a more human emotion. Um, and where you're not you're not certain of the outcome, that's why you need to invest yourself in in hope. Um, but I wouldn't. You know, in, in no way would I want to um, uh, come out as a as a an opponent of progress or someone who doesn't value um, technology. Um, though I'm an environmentalist, I certainly got a Promethean streak in me as well. Um, but all right, let me turn the question back to you. What do you, what how do you understand progress? I'm sure thank you because I unfortunately missed the lecture, but um. I guess um, I agree with you, and I think um, well, my, my peers don't buy that economic growth looks like progress to them, it doesn't feel like progress. Um, I suppose when I think about progress, I think about um, things like good relationships, skills which are, I think, ne uh, needed have been missed out on, like the ability to grieve properly, the ability to care and nurture for small beings, for animals, for non-human entities. Um, I think it probably looks like balance. So I think paying attention to the relationships between uh, elements within a system, um, rather than just sort of a violent reductionism, which can I think cause quite a lot of harm, both in terms of the way we think about how to solve problems, but also how we how we relate to them and how we can shut them out. Um, I think probably patience, about the cultivation of particular uh, qualities within organisations and individuals that um, maybe are. Uh, 
are missing in certain paradigms of progress currently. Um, for me, there's an element of social justice um, that kind of progress would look tend towards uh, in a way that's not at the moment. And I think one can't look at that without considering the sort of 100 million refugee, climate refugees that are anticipated. Um, so I think it, it very much means about how we respond to each other and how we construct organisations, our societies, our individual purchasing behaviours, um, how we listen, um, intergenerational relationships. Uh, I think there's a, there's a bunch of different things which to me feel like we could make progress on and aren't included in a linear growth trajectory. Okay, so you wouldn't necessarily see progress as a material yes. and a, and a, or an unending no. thing. No. But whatever. Okay. I think the idea of progress historically, yeah. yeah, I think that's what it was. I wonder if the youth are more, because the, the religion's failing them more than yeah. most, they're the ones that are becoming heretics. Mm. About 70, there was a survey in, in the US recently about 70 something percent of uh, under 30s consider themselves spiritual but not religious. They want to consider it. <coughs> Interesting. Yeah. Yes? Um, surely it's sensible to look at history. And uh, if you look at history, there's plenty of civilizations that have collapsed. They collapsed basically because they didn't think scientifically and they ran out of resources. And the reason why we've done remarkably well over the last 300, 400 years is because of the rise of scientific thinking, as pointed out by Popper. Stephen Pinker, best example, that the Enlightenment has been a uh, means by which we now support more or less seven and a half billion people, whereas previously we hard pushed to support a billion um, before scientific thinking came in. And therefore, uh, it's been proven that religious thinking doesn't pay off. <laughs> and therefore, if you want to uh, solve problems, the way you solve problems is by evidence, getting evidence and understanding how nature works. And if you, if you work against nature, the record shows that nature will win. And uh, the, the, there are several collapsed civilizations to show that this is the case. And therefore, I think uh, it's quite right to go into religion, what uh, people like Simon and so on. Uh, talked about um, because it it is non-scientific thinking they're not they're ignoring the evidence I mean Peter Holmes an example always annoys me he, he, he thinks it, what he's saying basically is something will turn up it always has done in the past technology has always kept up so obviously it's going to go on there's no logical <coughs> basis for saying that so I think I'm afraid that it simply doesn't stand up as a as a thesis, and by Popper, I think every scientific thing is a hypothesis, and it's ready to be destroyed as a, as a thesis. Um, I'd, I'd just say on that, um, uh, Popper wrote um, Poverty of Historicism, where he was <laughs> criticizing pseudo-scientific social theories of historical development. And you can very easily fit um, some of these economic theories um, whereby, as you say, effectively they bake in the idea that uh, we've um, things haven't run out so far, therefore nothing will run out in the future. Things will turn up, but the, they always have. Um, and they fit yeah, yeah. very well into Popper's framework of critique. No, he said that... Uh, Exactly. He and he particularly criticizes the approach which treats trends, historical contingent trends, as ahistorical absolute laws. And uh, you can see that very clearly, I think. So I think you're agreeing. We are agreeing. <laughs> <laughs> Just to be clear, the religious thinking, to my mind, uh, is superstition. 
But I think that there might be the, the, there is an argument to say that there's more to our world in the past, which I think you're putting than just the science, because in a way, the faith in science is it could be said to be a religion. But let's um, we'll move on. Let's go to the back there. Uh, um, I really enjoyed your talk. Thank you so much. I just wanted to ask whether you thought your theory, uh, whether if there's any room for adding a sort of developmental aspect to your theory, in the mm -hmm. sense that maybe not necessarily the idea of everything, like a, a technological innovation might be applied ge as equally throughout geographies in the sense that countries might not be as m uh, maybe innovative or as advanced or maybe have different sort of histories or backgrounds that need to be taken into account and where then you would place the implementation, how I suppose you would place the implementation of your theory, if that makes sense. Um, I think so. Um, I think effectively what I am, what I'm focused on is a, um, well, in terms of the recent history, it's the limits to growth debate, which has effectively been driven by environmentalists in North America and, uh, Western Europe and Australia primarily, and it's um, you know developing in effectively conditions of the greater um, the great acceleration post war um, creating conditions of mass affluence in those countries um, and from that as well. Um, Conditions of mass pollution, which were becoming very well, you know, people were very well aware of them in by the late sixties, um, and then the those who have critiqued them. So I, I'm in terms of contemporary debate, I am focusing on something which has been driven by um, those industrialized nations. Um, again, in terms of the historic debate that I'm looking at, it's effectively a debate in Western Europe um, about Christian theology and then you know the secularization thesis debate is, is about that that intellectual history so I think effectively there's a lot I don't know that I'm not <laughs> he um, admits you heard absolutely it. <laughs> um, and that uh, I would want to grapple with more it's interesting, actually, that I've seen two books recently that have done a sort of history of philosophical thought, uh, a global, taking a global perspective. Uh, and I think that's, and that, it's interesting that they're just coming out at this time, I think, um, because in a way that might suggest at the beginning of belief that our own philosophical sort of thing is beginning to fail and we need to draw on ideas from other strands, other cultures and, and so forth in order to almost save ourselves. Oh, just on that though, um, uh, I'd just like to ask a question to people here. Um, does anyone know uh, the, what, the original language that laissez-faire uh, was translated from? Where the concept laissez-faire comes from? Ooh, that's a quiz. <laughs> Sorry? Latin? Latin? No. Oh, anyone else? Anyone else? So it's Francois Kinai um, popularized the term laissez-faire uh, in the 18th century, but he got it from the Chinese Wu Wei, <laughs> um, especially the Tao. Um, and what did it mean to the Chinese then? A principle of good government that there's the 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 way. Will, you know, will self-organize, and therefore government should leave the land. That sounds. Um, so, so in that sense, I think um, Western economic thoughts being this is a revelation to me when I found out. <laughs> it's um, come from China. Uh, yes, immensely impacted by um, Eastern thought. Brilliant. Well, I think we are um, uh, at the. the, the at the end of our formal time, and obviously we can talk a lot more about this, but I think we probably need a drink. Um, 
<laughs> to, uh, to to help us keep going in the in, in the absence of a, a, a theological solution. Um, so I'd like to thank Richard very much, and uh, I'm sure he's going to stay around. I'm sure there's lots of space for further uh, talk, but uh, thank you, Richard.